Great to see everyone today. And at this time, I would like to introduce our first speaker, Sylveda Maani Ewing. Sylveda Maani Ewing is an author, speaker, international lawyer, and founding director of the Center for Peace and Global Governance. She is also a member of the CGS Board of Directors. Of all the presenters at this conference, she's the only one who's created the model she's presenting. It is the most contemporary of the models. She will be presenting on what she calls a principle-driven World Federation of States. So Veda will be speaking for 40 minutes, and then we will open the floor for additional 15 minutes for questions and answers. Please be sure to put your questions in the chat box and I will ask Saveda. Please be sure to start your question with a question mark so we can recognize that it is a question. At this time, Saveda, Donna will be keeping time for us and we'll jump in at the halfway mark and let you know when you hit the five minute left in your presentation as well. Are there any questions? Salveda, are you ready? I'm ready. Thank you okay, for that. You may take the floor. <laughs> okay. Well, it's delightful to be here with all of you. Um, I'm sorry that I was not able to attend the other two days of the conference. Uh, we have a lot going on. My husband has COVID. Um, I don't think I've washed and cleaned and disinfected so much in years and fractured toes as well. So I'm hobbling around in a surgical shoe. So my apologies, <laughs> but we're here and ready to go. So I'm going to share my screen. Um, and can you see everything okay? Yep, All you right. got it. Excellent. So I'm going to be speaking about a principle driven World Federation of States. I want to start with two observations made by two very smart human beings. The first was Buckminster Fuller, who was an American systems theorist, writer, designer, inventor, philosopher, you know, one of those Renaissance men. And he said, you never change things by fighting the existing reality. To change something, build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. And then, of course, we have our favorite saying that's attributed to Albert Einstein that we've all heard many times, but bears repeating here that insanity, the definition of it, is doing the same thing over and over, expecting different results. Now, if there's one thing that we can be absolutely sure of in our world today, it is that we need dramatic change. The old models of doing things are not working. And no time in our collective history has this truth been so evident. The way we've done business simply cannot go on. The stakes are way too high. We've managed to put ourselves in existential crisis, not just in one way, <laughs> but in several ways. So it's time to accept reality as it is. Um, before we can move on to any kind of model or vision, we need to accept where we are. We then need to create a vision and figure out how to bridge the gap between here and there. So it's become blindingly obvious that the models of governing and organizing society that we've used at the global level have not worked and need to be discarded in favor of something that does. So one of the key things that we need to recognize, and you bear with me, because we need to figure out, we need to motivate ourselves to actually do once we get to the model. It's like, why do we need to do it? So many great models around in the world, nobody's motivated to do it. So here's our motivation. It's time to recognize that institutions, laws, policies, constitutions, for those of us in the United States, principles are there to serve our well-being and happiness, and not for us to be sacrificed merely to say, oh, we've upheld this institution or policy. 
In a world that is subject to the immutable law of decay and change, these two need to be relegated to the heap of obsolescent doctrines if and when the time comes that they don't serve us. Another way of thinking of this is that humanity as a collective whole has been going through stages of growth and although going through a very turbulent adolescence is now approaching its maturity. And so the institutions and processes that were completely appropriate for it in its more immature years no longer fit and need to give way to new capacities and ways of being. Humanity as a whole has evolved. We've become incredibly interconnected and interdependent in ways that basically made us a single organism. What happens when you become a single organism, think the human body, is that a human body also becomes prone to systemic risks. This is all that's happened. We have become interconnected and, and interdependent in unprecedented ways. If we had any doubt about it, COVID, the war in Ukraine that engendered the various global crises, energy, food, economic, et cetera, the threat of nuclear war, all of these should have woken us up to this fact. Um, and all we need to do now is really create a new model in which these risks of having evolved into a single organism can be intelligently managed. This idea is summed up beautifully by a Singaporean diplomat who was president of the Security Council for a number of years, Kishore Mahubani. He said, whereas humanity used to be 193 boats bobbing on the sea of international life, it has now become a ship with 193 cabins. And then he goes on to bemoan the fact that although each cabin is extremely well regulated internally, think nation states, the ship as a whole lacks both a captain and a crew. So once we get into turbulent seas, there is nobody in charge. <laughs> Again, our recent experience, current continuing experience with the pandemic, and we're still suffering from it. I have a husband who's been you know, suffering from terrible symptoms for almost 10 days now, despite being up to date with vaccines. So COVID and all the, the other global um, challenges really speak to the fact that we are at sea, no pun intended. So what humanity needs right now is a set of collective decision-making and enforcement institutions capable of addressing these collective problems so that we can meet the needs and challenges of this age. If we needed any proof of the fact that we need this, I'm not gonna belabor this, but Come on, guys, look at this. The climate change, 27 years of meeting. Here we are, they're in Sharm el Sheikh, meeting yet again. And yet we have been unable to keep global temperatures from rising uh, above 1.5, more than 1.5 degrees above pre industrial levels. We're going to get there and we're going to miss the target and we're going to go way beyond it beyond it. Meanwhile, as we're faced with a tsunami, we're still arguing about how many sandbags each country should bring and how they should be arranged. I mean, we're nowhere near being able to do what we need to do. To think that we can use a system of voluntary pledges to deal with a catastrophe of this scale is, is laughable. It's child's play. Then we've got the war and conflict. Tigre, Yemen, DRC, Syria, Myanmar, Ukraine. Ukraine has now been the latest kind of trying to wake the world up to the fact that there's so much misery and bloodshed. President Zelensky, I think, was onto something when he told the Security Council this year that if they couldn't do their jobs, they better go home. His idea to create a U24, a United for Peace 24 collective security standing force is a brilliant one, and I'll come to it later. Thirdly, um, if we need any proof of our interconnectedness and the fact that our old systems don't work, again, the Ukraine crisis. We now have a global energy crisis, a global food crisis, a global economic recession, the threat of a nuclear war, which would be catastrophic, even if it were limited both geographically and in time, and possibly even a third world war. 
Now, if there's any one single lesson to be gleaned, and this is the foundation of the model that I'm going to propose, if there's any one single lesson that all these cascading crises are driving home, it is that the existence of a certain law that governs our social existence, and that is the law of oneness. So here's the way I think about it, folks. Just as in the physical world, there are certain laws that act on us, like the law of gravity, and that we have to take into account when, for instance, building an airplane, we could choose to ignore it. We definitely have free will choice. There is no doubt about that. I could just blithely say, hey, I don't believe there's such a law as the law of gravity. I'm entitled to do that. However, I'd be very foolish to try to build an airplane not taking that law into account. The same is true with the law of oneness. It is a fact of life. And the fact that we have fail to take it into account in building our political, um, uh, environmental, economic, et cetera, all our institutions and systems, um, it, it is, there's really no need for us to be surprised that all of these systems are catastrophically failing. We fail to take into account this incredibly important principle. So where do we go from here? Um, the truth is that the catastrophes will only continue and increase uh, unless we start building new models that take into account the law of oneness and a couple of other principles that I will expound on um, in a minute. Um, the only solution in the long term is to build a global world federation, democratic world federation, which is what CGS is all about, right? Arnold Toynbee spoke about the need for some form of world government in the 1970s. And he also said, look, we're very allergic to the idea of any form of political unification for the planet. And yet he said that he predicted that as soon as we were faced with a truly existential crisis, and he thought it was going to be the atomic crisis, and Lord knows we may still get into a nuclear war. I, I'm not sanguine about the fact that we won't. I think we may very well end up there if we don't learn our lessons in a hurry. Um, that once we were faced with that kind of existential crisis, he predicted we would turn on a dime, get over our allergies, which he said were actually just a bad habit. And he said, the good news about bad habits is you can change them. So um, he said, we would change that and we would move, albeit kicking and screaming towards some form of, of limited world government. The alternative being mass suicide. And you see this quote here on your slide. So how do we bridge the gap between here and this world government or global federation? So what I propose is a, a two-step uh, model. Let me address the UN issue head on. Honestly, the time has passed to, to tinker at the edges with UN reform. I think we had, there was a window of opportunity. I think that window is way gone. Do I think we should scrap the United Nations? No, because they do some things really well. They're very useful. Unfortunately, for the most critical challenges facing humanity today, such as nuclear proliferation and nuclear war, war and conflict in general, the pandemic, et cetera, et cetera, they have proven themselves completely inadequate to the task. So keep them. Um, give them things to do that they're good at, but let's move on and alongside the UN, build a model, starting with an interim model. So what is this interim model? This interim model is the creation of a supranational global authority that is to uh, manage and or own critical energy resources to ensure their equitable distribution. Okay, why do I start here? I firmly believe that given the skittishness we have in our world today, I don't think we're ready for a leap from where we are to global democratic world federation with the full panoply of a global legislature, a world executive, a standing police force, and, and, and a world court with compulsory jurisdiction and binding uh, judgments. 
So I think the model that I would espouse following is that um, proposed by Jean Monnet when he proposed the European coal and steel community. And by the way, when he proposed this, if you've read the history and the biography of Monet and his autobiography, it was a very unpopular idea. But here was the idea. The nub of it was start in a narrow sphere of endeavor. In, in the case of the ECSC, it was regional. Here I'm proposing international endeavor. Craft institutions that solve some seemingly intractable challenges. In this case today, the three, the triad of challenges that we would be tackling are climate change, equitable distribution of energy and nuclear proliferation. And note, these are the three biggies when it comes to the Ukraine war. We now are recognizing that with the energy crisis, um, it, because of a broken system of producing and distributing energy, we are now exacerbating the climate change problem. And we are now creating a nuclear potential, uh, a, a nuclear problem as well. So well, we, can, we can unpack all of that later. Once we do this, in other words, uh, tackle three seemingly intractable challenges, we build confidence that acting collectively to resolve global challenges is something that's possible. And having done that, we then gradually and methodically expand into other spheres of endeavor that would then lead us to the second step, which I call the ultimate step, which is the democratic world federation that we're all familiar with. But let's go back to this first interim model. The most important feature of this model is that it has to have woven into its very structure and processes certain a set of what I would call global ethics. This, by the way, has become a term of art in the international relations area just in the last, I'd say, eight to 10 years or fundamental principles. So when I started writing about this 20 years ago, I was talking about identifying a set of global principles that we can all agree on. And then over time, I started to see people starting to develop this language of a set of global ethics, which I find fascinating and exciting because we need to have more people on board so that we can get unity of thought that leads to unity of action. Now, why is it important to start with principles? Well, here what Kishore Mahubani, the guy who talked about the ship, said here's one of the problems with the way the ship is run. Each cabin has its own set of principles uh, and rules by which it governs itself. However, he says, unfortunately, some of those principles are actually dangerous for the well-being of the ship as a whole. So we need to all come together, all the cabins, and figure out what set of principles can we agree on that uh, on the basis of which we will then make decisions about what happens to the ship, especially in a storm and turbulent seas. Now, Gareth Evans, who was the former president of the International Crisis Group and prior to that, the foreign minister of Australia and uh, just a, quite a luminary in the field of international relations, gave a brilliant talk a number of years ago in which he said, uh, that in all his years as a politician, so the, a politician at the local level, at the regional level, at the national level, and at the international level, he has come to one single conclusion, and that is that the only way to solve, effectively solve, our global challenges and create global mechanisms that work is to start by identifying the set of principles upon which we are going to proceed and build these institutions and these processes. And he said, unfortunately, that is not the way business is done at any level of government. So you've got Kishore Mahubani, you've got Gareth Evans, Ian Golden, professor at Oxford, talks about the need for developing a set of global ethics. Pascal Lamy, the former head of the WTO. So these are not just people sitting in their ivory towers. The reason I mentioned these names is to demonstrate that these are people who've been out in the real world doing real things. They're not just members of nonprofits. I don't say that glibly, but that's to say they've actually been out there doing stuff, nor are they just people people who are academics sitting in ivory towers with no connection to the real world. These are people who've been through the school of hard knocks and have all concluded each in their own way that the place to begin is with principles. Now, what sorts of principles are we talking about here? 
Well, the most important principle is the principle of oneness. What does that mean? I want to kind of phrase it differently. Another way to look at it is that the only way of guaranteeing in today's interconnected world, the only way for a single nation to guarantee its own advantage, its self-interest, is to guarantee and ensure the advantage of the whole. Why? Because we have become like the human body. So it doesn't make sense for the liver to say, I don't care if the lungs are diseased. I'm out for number one. You know, that may have worked when we were 193 boats, but it doesn't work anymore. So common sense and logic and uh, a good mix of realism coupled with idealism uh, dictate that we recognize that principle. And I am firmly convinced that once our leaders actually get this one point, this one point, that the advantage of their countries can only be ensured by ensuring the advantage of the whole, it'll be a game changer. The hows and the models and what should we do? Should we do this or should we do that? All of that, they will be able to decide very quickly because folks, ultimately, you and I are not gonna make those decisions. It's gonna be those who are in, in leadership capacities that will. Now, can they be influenced? Can we inject ideas? Absolutely. And that's why I'm in the business. I'm in alongside you all as well as raising um, consciousness at the grassroots level so that we will elect the kinds of fit leaders who will make the kinds of decisions that we need and that we can hold their feet to the fire. So equitable and equal treatment, fairness and justice, another one of those principles. Now, these may sound glib to you, but I'm going to demonstrate in a second why they're anything but glib. Another principle is focus on the collective good versus national good. Get rid of this notion, this, this outworn notion that there is such a thing as unfettered nationalism. It just doesn't exist anymore. And I have an interesting story on that when it comes to the responsibility to protect uh, how it came into being. The, one of the guys who actually was responsible for bringing it into being told, told a very interesting story. If you remember me, I'll tell you about it. And has to do with the fact that all the leaders of, of the world recognize that, in fact, they do not have unfettered nationalism. Okay. Beta, you are so, a halfway through. So thank you. So Beta, so, you're halfway thank, through. Thank you, Donna. Thank you. Maybe putting something in the chat would be great. Um, a supranational global authority to manage um, um, it, to manage all sources of, of energy. So, oh, by the way, on, on the issue of principles, Jean Monnet, when he created the European Coal and Steel Community, this was one of the points he used to hammer home at, at the start of every meeting. <laughs> He was president of the ECSC for a number of years, and he would say, we're gathered here to seek a fusion of our interests as nations, not merely to engage in another effort to maintain an equilibrium of those interests. Again, he was a guy who'd been the deputy secretary general of the League of Nations, and he knew very well how intergovernmental uh, politics worked and how it, it basically didn't work. Um, all right. Supranational global authority. Let's look at how these principles when put into practice. And Jean Monnet, I don't know guys, honestly, if he thought in terms of principles, but the institutions that he proposed wove into the very structure and processes, the principles of oneness, of, of fairness, of equity, of looking to the collective good. If you unpacked any single aspect of his policies, you will see that these principles are baked in. He didn't talk about it, but he was a Catholic and, um, and, and it was the man of, of God, as were the other two who set up the European Coal and Steel community, which I find fascinating too, again, different topic, role of religion and transforming human society, right? So how do we set up this global authority? First of all, it would have democratic legitimacy. The system I propose is that each national legislature elect two people to serve on this institution. Once all nations, all legislatures have elected two, all, all those folks who are elected would get together and from amongst themselves, they would elect 19 to serve for a period of time on, on, on this uh, global authority. They would be completely autonomous. 
So the way Monet structured the Treaty of Paris in 1951, uh, one of the rules that everybody actually abided by, which, which is fascinating for those of you who are skeptics, he said, you're not allowed to take instructions from your national governments. And if national governments seek to, to give them to you, you turn a blind eye because you're there to what? To serve the collective interest of the member nations. You're not there to serve the interests of your country. Now, to ensure autonomy, he ensured that there was autonomy in funding. So whereas all international organizations were based on national contributions, and we know how that works, the more you contribute, the more the country thinks that it should have a say in how everything's run, and then everybody else gets really annoyed and frustrated, and people start acting out, and that's the beginning of the end. So instead of going through all of that hoopla, he said, you take the production of coal and steel and you take 1% of the, uh, uh, the, the revenues and, and you levy basically that tax, that 1% becomes the source of the funding. So we can do something similar on revenues from producing oil, gas, nuclear energy, et cetera. Okay, transparency. Something again, we lack today. So I've been reading a lot of articles about the current global energy crisis. So one of the big issues is lack of transparency. Which country needs how much? Which country is producing how much? How does this all work? And to do it in a timely fashion. So this is again, has got to be baked in as it was with the ECSC. The power, it should have the power to invest and upgrade capabilities. Again, I am absolutely, I must say, I am floored as I read the articles about why we're in the pickle we're in right now with the energy crisis to discover that one of the reasons is that countries have not been investing money in, in creating the facilities needed to either produce the energy or in terms of LNG facilities, the liquefied um, natural gas, uh, again, to have those, um, have the equipment and have the facilities available and to be able tra to transport it. So even if you've got, you've got the natural gas, you can't convert it. Even if you can convert it, you can't transport it. And this is crazy because we know we should be able to know exactly who needs how much when. Um, <laughs> And the fact that there's no transparency because we've got a system of cartels that are just out to make profits for themselves is part of the problem. Okay, decision-making, uh, it has to be done as, it, uh, as you would in a college by majority decision-making after you have a quorum of half the members present, as opposed to intergovernmental organizations where usually we require unanimity or veto, which is again, the kiss of death, because if you are able to agree on anything, it will be the lowest common denominator. Decisions have to be binding and enforceable. Again, ECSC decisions were binding and enforceable using the, the national courts of the member nations themselves. Brilliant, absolutely brilliant model. Can't think of anything better because you can't rely on the good faith of nations to, to follow through as we see today and as we've seen over and over. The authority also has to have a separate power to fine and sanction recalcitrant uh, nations as they did with the ECSC, including withholding revenues that are due to them. And then there was, in addition to being able to use the courts of national states, there was uh, a, a, a separate court that, that the ECSC could, could use um, in order to deal with, with um, uh, conflicts. Guys, for those of you who are skeptical, the ECSC actually worked. So when Jean Monnet used to go around talking about this, everybody would just wish the guy would shut up, honestly, that he was a pain in the neck. And uh, he said very smartly, he said, listen, you, you go, go right ahead, nay say all you like. He said, I'll tell you something, this system, the way it exists is gonna crash. And when it does, all the naysayers, you're going to be the first people lining up for anything, any kind of solution, right? And then we'll have a plan. And then if you're interested in it, maybe you'll accept it. So that's the kind of vision, right? And his model not only solved the coal and steel crisis of Europe, stopped the eternal fighting between the Germans and the French, who, by the way, used to talk about each other in their literature, the way the Arabs and Israelis talk about each other. I, I went to school in Israel. I went to Arab school and I lived in an Israeli neighborhood. I know how these folks talk about each other. 
and reading the literature, the French and Germans, very similar. So they say things like, this is the French and Germans, we drink hatred of each other with our mother's milk. We will always fight each other. We will always be at war. We will always hate each other. This will never end. And yet, once the European Coal and Steel Community came into being, it brought an end to war within Europe. So um, once we have created this successful model, <coughs> excuse me, and we've demonstrated that it works and it helps. So how does it help to deal? It, it will help to deal with the equitable distribution of energy. How does it help with climate change? When you have a supranational body that is in charge, that owns and manages all the sources of energy, it can, for the good of, of global society, start to tell us what kinds of energy we can use. And we can slowly start to reduce our reliance on fossil fuel, increase, you know, put money into R&D, increase um, uh, uh, research into alternative renewable sources of energy, put nuclear in the mix, which by the way, I know some of you, I've talked about this before, I know you hate the idea of using nuclear energy. However, all the experts, including many environmental experts, will tell you that if we are truly to save this planet from climate change, at least for a, for a few decades, we are going to need nuclear energy in the mix as things stand right now. We're simply not in a position to do an, an exchange of renewable of clean energies for fossil fuels. We're not there yet. And it would be catastrophic if we tried to do that. And the good news, and again, this is a whole nother topic. Yes, we should not be using the nuclear technologies that have caused the kind of problems we saw in Fukushima and, and, and uh, a thousand island, whatever the, the, the place in New York. There are amazing new technologies that are cost a fraction of what the others cost that can be built very quickly in five years that use non-fissile materials. So you cannot then build atomic bombs from them and that are have so many incredible safety features um, so, so this is a whole nother topic, but if, but we would need to have a supranational global authority that was in charge to ensure the transparency and the, the collective good, and to ensure that if we do put a, a power plant somewhere, for heaven's sakes, let's not put it, put it somewhere where there is a fault line for an earthquake or where, <laughs> where we're prone to tsunamis. I mean, this is exactly the kind of thing where we need to need the international community to come together and work collectively. So once we've demonstrated that we can do this, then we uh, move to a, the, a global world federation. I'm not going to unpack it in detail for you because you all know what that looks like. Um, a global legislature with the authority to pass binding laws in certain narrow spheres where the only solution is for everybody to work together. Climate change is one of those blindingly obvious ones. We cannot solve it with five nations, 10 nations, 20 nations. Everybody has to be on board. Um, an executive uh, that is backed by an international standing force is Zelensky's idea. So this is brilliance. A U24, what did he mean? He said, we need to have an international standing force that can, as soon as there is a potential breach of the peace anywhere in the world, within 24 hours, that's what the 24 stands for, step in and nip it in the bud before it proliferates. Wow, yes. So I've been talking about this for 20 years. I, you know, I, I feel like I've gotten gray talking about this, but brilliant that a man who is in some position of power is able to talk Turkey and say, and by the way, I'm not involved in partisan politics. I'm not for or against any national leader or any political party. But when I hear a good idea, that I believe serves the good of humanity, I'll be the first to stand up and say, hey, you know what, guys, that's an idea I think we should listen to. So the U24, I think, guys, is an idea we should listen to. And, I, and I'm, it's just sad that the media did not pick up on it and run with it. And finally, we need a, a world court with compulsory jurisdiction and the ability to enforce its judgments, which if we had a standing force, it would be able to do. I want to end with this quote from um, Robert Schuman, who was one of the founders of the European Coal and Steel Community. He was a foreign minister of France. Very smart guy. By the way, 
So in terms of creativity, so let, let's start with what he says. He says, world peace cannot be safeguarded without the making of efforts proportionate to the dangers which threaten it. So folks, our job is to not tinker at, uh, with things like the UN at the edges, but to come up with radical, creative new ideas and propose them in bite-sized pieces that will be politically and otherwise palatable. Um, by the way, he um, uh, when when Monet came up with this brilliant idea, he knew that he if he went through the bureaucrats that they would nix it before it got <laughs> to the foreign minister. So Monet was a Frenchman; he was the planning commissioner for France. So he he gets to know the secretary for um, I, I'm, I'm planting seeds here for you guys. Uh, he gets to know the secretary of uh, Robert Schuman. Uh, who is packing his bags to, uh, for the weekend for Robert Schumann to go to his country home and work. And he and Monet says, please slip these papers into the bag. I just, I just want him to have a chance to look at them. So the guy does. And as soon as Schumann sees this, I'm getting goosebumps. As soon as he sees this proposal, he thinks this is it. This is the solution we've all been looking for. He knows that he needs to get Germany on board. And he knows that if he uses the diplomatic channels, again, all the bureaucrats will nix it. So he sends a private messenger to Chancellor Adenauer in Germany and says, hey, look, you know, this is man to man, human being to human being. What do you think? Adenauer, God bless him, reads this and realizes this is the solution, that Germany's self-interest can be guaranteed by guaranteeing the self-interest of the interest of all the nations of Western Europe. So he says, yes, sends the messenger back. As soon as Schumann, Schumann is, is in the middle of his weekly radio broadcast, as soon as he gets the message, he interrupts the broadcast. And before anyone can scuttle anything, announces to the world that Germany and France have agreed to create a supranational high authority. Now, the details haven't been ironed out yet. Guys, it's the idea. It is the idea. We need to get a gripping idea, a visionary idea that will pull people along. If we get too much in the weeds between comparing models and the, this little detail and that little detail, you're gonna lose people. I know I get lost. It's like, oh, this is so boring. Um, excite me with an idea. Excite me with an idea. Show me why it's necessary. Motivate me, get me all excited. And then I will follow you to the ends of the earth. And I will sit and go through all the boring details. So I think this is what we need to do. There's a lot more here. I, I simply don't have time. I'm going to end. Um, if you want further details on exactly how the interim model is to be built, uh, you can learn about it in my book, Bridge to Global Governance, Tackling Climate Change, um, Equitable Distribution of Energy and Nuclear Proliferation. And if you're interested in how I see the ultimate model unfolding, and uh, it's I've also written a book on that, Building a World Federation, the key to resolving our global crises. I've put them in the slides here. Both are available uh, as uh, digital books or, or um, trade paper on Amazon. And with that, I will end here and maybe we can open it up to questions and answers. Let me see, where's my stop share? Yes, thank you so much, okay. Silveda. Um, I'm actually reading your book now. Oh, <laughs> I'm on the you. Metro reading the book and learning and learning. And like you said, giving me goosebumps because there is so much information um, to learn. But um, thank you so much for your presentation. Now I will be asking you questions from our audience members. Um, we have 15 minutes for the Q&A portion. And if you have a question, we have tons of questions already, but if you have a question, please put it in the chat starting with a question mark. So it's easy to spot. If you don't get to all your questions, please be reminded we do have a 30 minutes for a formal um, breakout session with Saveda. So at this time, I'm gonna begin asking you the question, Saveda, and you could just answer. The first question we have here is, who or what would be the most effective entity to call for this? The UN, the superpowers, global leaders, Okay. Global, Wonderful. correction, global religious leaders, my apologies. 
So that's, this is a brilliant question. And I, I, I think it doesn't lend itself to a single answer. So mm. I firmly believe, first of all, that our starting point, and I believe this is what we have all been engaged in, those of us who've participated in, in CGS work for years, First, we need to raise consciousness amongst the grassroots. Look, if you want to plant something new, the soil has to be ready. Mm. Um, if the soil, this by soil, I mean the mindset, levels of awareness, um, an understanding of how we got to where we are, the poor choices that we've made in the past that have gotten us here, um, and then also a vision of how things could be different, uh, a sense of empowerment that we do have free will choice as human beings. It's one of our gifts, uh, one of the divine gifts bestowed on us, or just one of our gifts if you don't believe in, in, a, in the divine. Um, it's what distinguishes us from the animal and from other forms of creation, this ability to create and to, to rationalize and to invent and to choose, right? Um, so we start there. That then hopefully over time creates an educated public that becomes smart about electing fit leaders. We, at least in the countries where we get to elect our leaders, have a lot of responsibility for the kinds of leaders we elect. We give them a lot of power, ability to make decisions. So we have to now mm -hmm. take on that, you know, uh, I acknowledge that we have that responsibility. So again, that comes back to education, creating unity of vision, unity of thought that then leads to unity of action. Having said that, I also happen to believe that if we could just get a handful, a handful of leaders who are enlightened and get to them however, friends, family. When I wrote my first book, I went up the street here where we live. Our daughter was at the public school and my one of my doctors was there. She was sitting on, on the ground saying, hey, Samita, what are you up to? I said, I'm excited. I've just published my first book. And she said, show me, show me, show me. And I showed it to her and she said, okay, give me a few copies. I said, why? She said, well, I'm about to walk over to the home of, of Barack Obama. And this is before he was elected. <laughs> they were campaigning in New Hampshire at the time to Barack Obama and then Susan Rice. And she just rattled off a bunch of names. And she said, and I think this, because she was flipping through, she said, I think this is exactly what they need to read. Um, and so she did. And then for Thanksgiving, she ordered a few more books for me because they were all going to be meeting for Thanksgiving. So we need to just speak about what we're doing on the playground, at the water cooler, wherever, because I think that if we can get a handful of leaders who are enlightened and they come together for the good of the world with no other agenda, it can't be quid pro quo, I'll scratch your back, you scratch mine. No, the only th item on the agenda has to be bringing peace to planet Earth and to improving the lot of humanity. That's it. And they come up with this idea. And if any of these ideas are injected, they can then go around the world and seek gratification. And the reason I say this is the story of how the R2P, Responsibility to Protect Principle, came about. It's actually a fascinating story. I've heard it from the horse's mouth, so to speak, <laughs> mouths of two of the horses who were involved in it. And it started out with a group of, of people who were appointed by the Canadian government to this commission to, to redefine the whole question of sovereignty. And they came up with this brilliant, again, they were very creative. They did something nobody had done before. Everybody in the past talked about our right, my right as a country to do this, my right, my right, my right. Boy, am I so sick and tired of hearing that word, my right. And they said, let's stop talking about rights. How about we just say, isn't the whole reason we have governments and states so that we have a risk because we have a responsibility to take care of our people? So they started that way. They, they reframed the conversation. Long story short, they got a handful of people to agree to it. And then they traveled around the world. God bless these <laughs> people. I spoke to one of the guys who did the traveling. 
they sat and met with every single head of government and prime minister and, and ministers of government. And one of the questions they asked them was, do you think you have unfettered national sovereignty? And they were shocked. They said, we were sure at the time that we'd get some of those who'd say, absolutely. And they said, not a single one. They all said, we're not that stupid to think that we have unfettered national sovereignty. We all know that that sort of nationalism is dead. Now, that was in 2000, 2003. Uh, maybe things have changed now. But the point is, start with a handful of members. And yes, religious leaders have a role to play because they have sway over the masses. You know, if you're going to have influence, use it for good. Instead of sicking people on each other because, you know, my religion and yours don't agree on certain minutia, and instead of creating blood, bloodshed, let's um, leverage our power, those who are in the business of, of religion and be religious leaders, for the good of humanity by injecting positive ideas. So, yes, I think there is a role for religious leaders as well. Okay. Well, thank you. Another question we have here is, what's the incentive, incentive for nations to opt in, especially powerful nations that already see themselves as successful and self-sufficient? And a similar question is, how can the rich, mighty, and powerful be seduced to opt into the principle of sharing? <laughs> All right, so it starts with, I believe the nation state. I think the incentive to opt in is, is being done. It's not in our hands, it's out of our hands and it's coming, I, I firmly believe. I think that the idea that any country is self-sufficient is a chimera. Anyone who actually thinks that, well, that's interesting is what I'll mm -hmm. say. All we have to do is to see how you know how when wars used to happen, this happened even in Syria. Oh, that's their problem. It's their war. Let them duke it out, right? And already then we started to hear rumblings of, oh my gosh, this is, uh, there were articles in the paper calling it a proto, new, uh, a proto world war because increasingly nations were being drawn in on both sides and it was getting really dangerous. And it, it, it kicked off a bunch of global crises, including um, a, a, the refugee crisis in Europe, the refugee crisis, which was what triggered Brexit. Brexit has triggered massive problems in Europe, uh, including, <laughs> God, I'm half British, uh, God bless the Brits, uh, our economic problems right now. So this inability to think long-term and to see reality for what it is as human beings is a real problem. So this idea that we're self-sufficient mm -hmm. is just not true. Um, Ukraine, who would have thought that a war in Ukraine would cause a global food crisis and a global energy crisis and would cause a global economic recession with runaway inflation around the world? That, of course, coming on the heels of COVID and the supply chain problems and all of that, there is no such thing. So what, what is the incentive? The incentive is the understanding that we live in a world that whether we like it or not is interconnected. The egg has been scrambled. There is no unscrambling it. And I love listening to, oh, what's the gentleman's name? Who's the, he's the world renowned authority on globalization. I love it. He talks about how globalization has been an ongoing thing for 70,000 years at least. And, and the, the idea that we will try to undo it is, is just crazy. And that any time, and he goes through and demonstrates in all his books, he's at Columbia University. Oh, never mind. I can't remember his name. <laughs> that at any time, uh, humanity wanted to try and pull back the, 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 the scrambled eggness of our being or <laughs> globalization or say we are self-sufficient. It has led to what we've later talked about as the dark ages, because it's just impossible. So it's a chimera. The incentive isn't creating something new. The incentive is the raising awareness that we are so interconnected and interdependent that the only thing that makes sense is to adopt this. By the way, 
The ECSC is a really good case study in this because the nations of the six nations of Europe actually went through this process. So if you read the deliberations that were taking place in the parliaments of Europe, so I, I particularly point you to Belgium and the Netherlands, where they're going, wait a minute, wait a minute here. You're telling us that to them, coal and steel was the equivalent of oil, gas, and nuclear today. You're telling us that we should give up. So that's what you're talking about, ceding a modicum of sovereignty over something that's really important to you. We should give up the most important thing to us, coal and steel, upon which all our industry is based, upon which our entire rehabilitation, building our railways, our buildings, our shipyards, our, our weapons, stopping Germany from starting another war. You're asking us to give all this up and put it in the hands of a supranational authority that can create laws that bypass our parliaments, that's us, we the people here who are being asked to ratify this treaty, um, and that we don't get a say in it. And then you have the gall to ask to use our national courts to enforce those laws that we, the parliaments, don't get to, to pass. And on and on and on and on. And guess what? Despite, so these are smart people like you and I. They understood what it meant giving up. And despite that, in the end, they concluded that it was actually in the, their own best interests as nation states to cede this kind of sovereignty to a supranational organization because they would be better off doing it than not doing it. Mm. And then all the economic analyses, by the way, that, that were done after the ECSC wound up and came to an end after its 50 years, demonstrated that indeed each of the six member nations did a lot better you know, by orders of magnitude than they would have done if they had tried to come up with national plans, we're gonna be self-sufficient kind of approach to life uh, of their own. So this is a joke uh, to think that we're self-sufficient. We rely for everything, everything on other nations. Um, I, I mean, it's, I, I don't even know how to begin here, but yes, it's creating understanding of reality. We don't need to change the reality, reality exists. What we've done as human beings is we've stuck our heads in the sand. Our job is to help people pull their heads out of the sand and see reality for what it is. As soon as they do, this will be a cinch. Hmm. Okay. We'll probably just have um, time for one or two more questions, but quickly, Sylvana. No, we have until one, we have seven more minutes for this. Okay. Sylvana, um, you have produced many videos and are an articulate spokesperson for the World Federation. What response have you gotten and what have you learned in this process? <laughs> so the one thing I have learned um, is, I know I sound very passionate, I am very passionate, but the other thing I've learned is humility. I view my role and the role of others like me to sow seeds, to cast the seeds far and wide. The truth is we never know where these seeds fall. And sometimes they fall in the most unlikely of places, places where I could not have planned for them to fall. So recognizing that we need to do two things. We do need to plan. We need to be imaginative as a group and as groups of people uh, who are working shoulder to shoulder. We need to conceive of the best way to reach the largest number of people and to galvanize them. On the other hand, we also need to have faith that just by opening our mouths on a regular basis, things will fly. Um, Ken and I, my husband and I just came back from Kauai. We'd never been to the Hawaiian islands before. We went to celebrate our 25th wedding anniversary. And while I was so, this is another example, like the woman on the playground who happens to know these people in power whom I wouldn't know, right? How, how would I have known? No way. So um, I write to a friend of mine in, on one of the islands and say, hey, we're going to Kauai, do you know anyone? And he says, oh, I have this friend, Crystal, she's great. Um, let me put you in touch. So I write to Crystal and she says, oh my God, I just came back from Chicago and I was at a bar and I saw your book and I picked it up 
and I was sleep deprived. I had jet lag. So I read your book and I loved it. And I came back and I happened to know a member of the Supreme Court of Hawaii. So I gave the book to him and he's been involved in the, he's heavily involved in the COP meetings. So he's been sharing it with others. Okay, so this is one of those things where there's no way, right? So what have I learned is get out there and be active. Just be active, just do stuff. It really doesn't matter what you do. The mm -hmm. podcast I have, Reimagining Our World, has brought in amazing people. I've made friends I never would have made in a million years because people found it on Facebook and YouTube and they've gotten in touch and we've since had amazing conversations and they then offered to take this work, this material, these ideas that we are all of our ideas and pass them along generously to their contacts because they have a lot of contacts. Mm -hmm. So that's what I would say, wherever you are, bus stop, train station, airplane. Um, and I'll end with this last story about an airplane, um, building a world federation. I was in Holland giving a talk in 2015. On the way back, my seat was moved around five times. I was very annoyed, but you know, sometimes Providence, and I do believe that Providence has a hand in the way things work has a design and I ended up sitting next to this lady who's a gorgeous artist and opera singer who's married to a professor at Northwestern. Anyway, Josephine turns to me and says, what are you doing in Holland? I said, I just wrote a book, gave a book talk. She says, hand it over. And I'm thinking, wow, this woman's quite something. She says, don't worry, I'll give it back. We're 10 hours on the airplane. So she reads the book, it's short. Yamily, you have it. You can read it in 45 minutes as you know. And she says, oh my God, where did you get these ideas? And then the next thing I know, she excuses herself and I fall asleep. I get a tap on my shoulder. This uh, air stewardess comes over and says, excuse me, ma'am, are you so-and-so? Yes, we need you in the back. Oh dear. So I go into <laughs> the back and all the uh, flight attendants are there. They've suspended service for 20 minutes because Josephine has gone and told them about this book. And they're so excited about it that they have closed, and closed service on the airplane for 20 minutes so that I can give them a book talk in the back of the wow. airplane, right? So again, you just don't know. You just don't know. You, you can't make this stuff up, honestly. <laughs> So just be active, get out there, go, go to the cafe. I've met people at our local cafe here, amazing people who have taken the, the stuff and, and have run with it. So that's it. We're just insignificant cogs. This is where the humility comes in. But if we allow ourselves to be used, we will be picked up and used in exactly the ways we're meant to be used. And great. that's it. Great, great. Um, just one more. Can you say more ab about what the Global Energy Authority would do? Um, sorry, I'm just answering what? Bill Pace's question. Um, could someone else put the the, the title of Bridge yeah, to Global I Governments for, for Bill as well? What would the Global Energy Authority do? So, so its its role essentially is to manage all the energy resources that the key energy resources. So, think today, oil, gas, nuclear would be the main ones. Hopefully, we will get rid of coal, uh, but maybe we need to take all the coal taken out of people's hands so that we can shut it all down, um, and to ensure. Um, uh, that all nations have equitable access to meet their energy needs at reasonable prices. Mm. That is the goal of the global authority. Now, by putting nuclear into their hands, you're ensuring that no nation then can build a parallel um, military a nuclear facility or, or, or have a parallel nuclear weapons program that is illicit. That's how you handle the fear we have of nuclear proliferation, nuclear bombs. And beyond that, as I said, what's exciting to me is that thorium is, is, is one of the best ways, uh, one of the best materials to use to create nuclear energy. And it's non-fissile in the sense that you can't make bombs out of it like you can out of plutonium and highly enriched uranium. 
And so it's like once you have an authority whose goal is to do what's best for the planet, i.e. we want to produce energy that is clean, cleaner than what we have, use nuclear in the mix as a transition while we get up to speed on our renewable energy, and we're going to put lots of money into that. Uh, but in the meantime, we're going to ensure that we use the best kind of material to create the nuclear mm -hmm. energy. It's going to be fast. It's going to be safe. We're going to pick our sites carefully. Um, and, and it's going to be impossible to make um, uh, nuclear weapons out of it. Uh, that, that's another. So that's, that's one of the benefits of what the, the authority would do. And then obviously the last one is climate change, right? To phase out reliance on unclean forms of energy and phase in as rapidly as conceivably possible uh, clean forms of energy. Again, keeping in mind that we're talking about the fusion of humanity's collective interests, as opposed to trying to maintain an equilibrium of interests between nations, something we've been trying to do for hundreds of years and it's abjectly failing. So mm -hmm. the definition of insanity is to keep trying to do more of the same. It doesn't work. Um, okay. okay. Well, thank you for all, all your um, questions. Just a reminder, we do have questions, of, uh, more questions for you that um, Saveda will be joining us for a breakout session. So you will have the opportunity to speak with her. We 